Amen. <clears throat> Tonight I want to uh, preach a sermon entitled Eternal Life. I just want to look at, you know, what eternal life is, you know, what you have to do to receive it, and then, you know, the things you have to do or not have to do to keep it, right? So let's look at, at the Bible here in John chapter 11. My first point is eternal life means you will never die. And the reason I, I turn here to John chapter 11, look down at uh, verse number 11. The Bible says, These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said he to said his disciples, Lord, if he sleepeth, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death. But they saw that he had spoke, they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. So Jesus here is saying, look, Lazarus is is he's referring to Lazarus as sleeping. And uh the, the disciples don't understand this. They don't, they don't get it. But he plainly speaks to them and he just says, Lazarus is dead. Now, we know later on in this passage that uh, later on in the passage in, let's see, what verse here? Uh, verse number 25, verse number 25, that Martha comes unto him and uh, he says, you know, that her brother shall rise again. And then verse 25 it says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And then verse 26, And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die, believest thou this. And so Jesus right here is saying that if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will never die. And he, he, he refers to a person that is dead physically as sleeping. And we know that when Jesus Christ comes back to this earth, that he's gonna, our bodies will be changed, we'll meet the Lord in the air, we'll receive a new body. And so our bodies aren't dead. One day we'll, we'll receive that body again, but it'll be a glorified body like unto the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why right here in this passage, it says that he sleepeth. And he, and he said plainly that they, he was dead. But I love to show people this verse, verse 26, when I'm out soul winning, if somebody gets saved, I like to just explain to them, look, you're never going to die. You know, that's just something cool you can explain to somebody. You can say, look, you know, you just believed on Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus actually said, you know, that if you believe in me, you shall never die. Believe us thou this. You know, that's pretty cool to someone who, who just gets saved. And, you know, they don't fully understand all the doctrines of the Bible. But they can know that there's eternal life and they're never going to die. And <clears throat> eternal life is, is, is twisted in a lot of ways. A lot of religions twist this, uh, this particular doctrine. And they teach that they have to keep eternal life by doing things and doing all this stuff. And we're going to debunk that in this sermon. But I want you to turn with me to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. <clears throat> While you're turning there, I'm going to read 2 Corinthians 5, 9. It says, Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. So, <clears throat> I think I put the wrong verse here. So, the Bible says, let me turn there. 2 Corinthians 5, 9. I did put the wrong verse. I don't know. <laughs> it says in verse 8. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So when we die, we're absent from this body and we're present with the Lord. So we, we, we know this from the story of, you know, the rich man and the beggar, where the rich man died. He was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom up in heaven. And the rich man died also and in hell lifted up his eyes. So in the contrast... You, when you die or your body's asleep on this earth, you're in the presence of the Lord. But in contrast, if you die without Christ, you're immediately in hell. So you, have, you can have eternal life or you can have eternal condemnation. So uh, uh, God is very extreme. You know, he's a God of extremes. You know, it's life or death. It's believe, not believe. It's very, it's very plain. It's very simple. I had you turn to John chapter 8. Look down at... Uh, uh, verse 51. This is interesting. <clears throat> Jesus talking to the Jews here. And it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. 
So again, it's talking about never dying. 52 says, Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast the devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets, and thou sayest, If a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death? Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead. Whom makest thou thyself? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him, and keep his saying. Now pay attention to verse 56. It says, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and saw it, and was glad. You know, the Jews didn't understand eternal life. Jesus Christ here is just saying, look, Abraham's not dead. Abraham is alive. You know, he rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it. Yeah, Abraham seen it from a different perspective than the disciples and from the Jews. He's seen it from heaven, you know. He's seen Jesus Christ's day, you know, from a, a, a heavenly perspective. So... That right there is just another place where it just says you'll, you'll never see death. You'll never die. When we, when we close our eyes on this earth and are dead in the body, we'll be immediately with the Lord. So go back to uh, John chapter 11, a few pages, back, uh, <clears throat> a few pages forward. Um, I'm going to read John 5, <clears throat> verse 39. It says, Search the Scriptures, for in them you think, that, you, think you have eternal life, and they are are they which testify of me, and ye will not come to me, that ye might have life. So the Jews, you know, they, they were seeking eternal life. They were seeking it through works and through keeping the law, keeping the Sabbath, you know, adding to the law. He you know, added a whole bunch of extra uh, doctrines and teachings to the law. We know that. But they thought that they had eternal life, but they are those that testify of Jesus Christ. And uh, they won't come to him that they may have life. Because all you have to do is come to Jesus Christ. You know, whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. You know, that, that, that's the true gospel there. So I had you turn back to John chapter 11. <clears throat> but you know, Jews, they had eternal life messed up. And there's a lot of religions today that have eternal life messed up. You know, Catholics, you talk to a Catholic, they don't understand eternal life. You ask them if they have it, and they're like, oh yeah. And they're like, well... Is there anything you do to lose it? Oh, yeah. It's like, oh, is that eternal? No. Mormons, they're all messed up on eternal life. Jehovah's Witnesses are definitely messed up on eternal life. Seventh-day Adventist, messed up on eternal life. Uh, they got to keep all these commandments. They're all works. They're all works-based. Calvinists, works-based. You know, they just call it perseverance of the saints. I'm going to give it this fancy title. But they, they, they teach that you have to you know, persevere until the end. You know, if you fall away, well, you're going to come back eventually. You know, but if you fall away and you never come back, then you're not truly really saved. That's what Calvinists teach. It's pretty crazy. But look back down at John chapter 11. <clears throat> and actually, we, we just read this, so I, I skipped ahead. But it, I was just going to reiterate that whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. So the Bible clearly over and over again stresses <clears throat> that... You have to believe as a means to obtain eternal life. You know, we know this. We go out soul winning. We teach people the Bible. And so my second point, I want you to just turn to John chapter 3. It's a familiar passage. But when you receive eternal life, Jesus Christ himself likened it unto being born again. Being born again. And rightfully so. It says in John chapter 3, verse number 3, it says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? How can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? So Nicodemus doesn't understand. He's, he's, he's grasping his straws here. Verse 5 says, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Uh, and so verse 6, this, that, which was, this is, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. So the Bible teaching right here very clearly that you're born of water when your mother gives birth to you on this earth. Her water breaks, 
and she goes into labor, and you are born. That's being born of water. But it also says, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. So when Jesus is talking about being born again, he's obviously talking about being born of the Spirit. And so you have to be born of the Spirit. You have to receive God's Spirit. And your, 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 your soul is quickened. You know, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23 says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So we know that a man has to come to you, somebody has to preach to you the gospel, because it says, by the word of God. You know, it's an incorruptible seed. If you speak English, the incorruptible seed is going to be the King James Bible. You know, the incorruptible seed is the Word of God right here in English. Uh, if somebody comes to you with a, you know, a New King James or a, you know, NLT or NET or a HIV, whatever they come to you with, they, you don't want to receive anything out of those books. You want the the incorruptible Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. It's forever settled in heaven. And you want to be born again of the Spirit. Um, turn to uh, 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. We're going to be in the book of John a lot because John expounds a lot upon these particular doctrines. 1 John chapter 5. <clears throat> I'm going to read John, uh, Romans 8. Verse 11 says, But if the spirit of man be raised up, Jesus, the spirit of man that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. So when you're born again, you receive the spirit of Christ, and he dwells in you. The, the spirit indwells the believer. So that's taught in the Bible. 1 John chapter 5, where I had you turn. Just look at verse number 1. It says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And every one that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. Verse 4, jump down, it says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And I like verse 5, it says, And who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth? that Jesus is the Son of God. So overcoming the world <clears throat> means that you've, you've overcome death, basically. You're, you'll never die. You've received eternal life. You've received the Spirit of God, and you've overcome the world. <clears throat> Turn with me to John chapter 10. One more verse I'm going to read is just Revelation chapter 2. It's one of the admonishments to the churches. It says, He that hath an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. So when you're born again, when you receive eternal life, you miss out on the on the second death. I mean, man alive. That's 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 something to be happy about. You miss out on the second life, uh, second death. But not only that, instead of having two deaths, you're gonna have you have two births now, right? So. You missed out on one death, and you gained an extra birth. So that's pretty cool. And everybody likes birthdays. Nobody likes funerals, right? Yeah, so that's that's pretty obvious. So that's just something neat to see. I always show that to people. Obviously, we show people the second death when we go out <clears throat> soul winning because they have to understand that, and then we show them how to overcome it. So my uh, third point, I had you turn to John chapter 10. <clears throat> is that you can't lose eternal life. You know, you're not going to misplace it somewhere. Or you can't do something that's going to keep you from having eternal life. Once you receive it, it's yours. We all know Romans 6.23, we show people this. It says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So that gift is eternal life. You know, that means it's forever. And I had you turn to John 10. Look down at verse 27. It says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So, you know, God puts you in His hand when you receive eternal life. And nobody can take you out of God's hand. You know, this is another passage that a lot of people have showed to somebody just to... Uh, 
just to confirm eternal life and how you can't lose it. I this is a verse I always show people when I show them uh, eternal security. <clears throat> but you know, there's a lot of other good passages. Turn back in you in John to chapter six, chapter six. <clears throat> And, I mean, why, why would it be called eternal life if you could lose it? I mean, I just don't understand the logic people have in all these false religions. They say, oh yeah, it's eternal life. And then they're like, but you can lose it. Like, okay. And I overcome some real hurdles on this one. <laughs> like, man. <clears throat> so John 6, look down at verse 38. It says, For I came down from heaven... Not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is my Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but, that, but should raise it up again at the last day. So here Jesus is saying, look, I'm not going to lose anything <clears throat> that the Father's given me. Remember, he's put you in his hand. He's not going to lose it. No man can take you out of his hand. And then verse 40, it says, And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one that seeth the Son and believeth on Him may have everlasting life. And I will raise Him up at the last day. You know, <clears throat> some people, they'll say you have to be a good person. You have to try to stop sinning. Or you have to be willing, you know, just willing to give up your sin. You know, but that's just not the case. You know, how willing do you have to be? You don't have to be willing at all. You just have to believe the gospel and call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. So, you know, that's what the Bible teaches. It's, it's very clear. You can't lose your salvation. It's eternal life, everlasting life. Uh, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 3. It says, because I just want to, I just want to give a, you know, an explanation of this. You know, some people say you have to stop sinning. You have to uh, be willing. But let's look at what the Bible says. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, I'm going to read 1 Peter 2, verse 24. It says, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. You know, it says should live unto righteousness. Now, does it say you have to, you know, being dead to sins, have to live unto righteousness? No, it says you should live unto righteousness. Uh, you know, we, we should want to live righteously and godly, but that's just not the case. Most believers are not going to, they might live a, a, a good life, but they may never, you know, grow spiritually. They may never get someone saved. They may never even go to church. But in the eyes of man, they live a good life, right? So I had you turn to 1 Corinthians 3 and verse, look down at verse number 11. It says, For other foundation can no man lay than that that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. Because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So the foundation is Jesus Christ. They're building upon it. Verse 14, it says, If any man's work abide, which he, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So we know it gives us examples there. It gives us those, those things, the wood, the hay, the stubble, gold, precious stones. We know that... Uh, the wood, hay, and the stubble, right? If you if you purge those things with fire, they're just going to turn to ashes. You know, they're going to go away. So some people have that foundation. They have a foundation of Jesus Christ. They're saved, but they build just uh, wood, hay, and stubble upon that foundation. You know, they just think, you know, being a good person, opening a door for somebody is, uh, you know, that's what they teach at these liberal churches, you know. Just be a good person. Uh, you know, be nice to everybody, you know. Don't, uh, don't judge, you know. But the thing is, that's not what the Bible is saying. You know, you need to build upon this foundation things that are going to last. Gold, silver, precious stones. Things that are, when they're tried by fire, they come out pure on the other side. You know, you may put some wood, 
some hay, some stubble on that foundation, but then you're also going to put some stone, you're going to put some, uh, you're gonna put some gold, some precious stones, and all these things, you're going to build it up. You're not just going to have all wood. You know, that's just not smart. You don't want all wood at, at the end when Jesus comes and He purges you. You don't want to be the one that's just saved so as by fire. You want to have something that, that, that comes through the fire, you know, so you can receive a reward at the end of the day. But the thing is, it does say that some people will be saved yet so as by fire. And that's my point with this passage, is that some people will not have any, uh, you know, they won't have any evidence of being saved. You'll never see them come to church. They'll never be baptized. But guess what? You'll see them in heaven one day. Amen. And we're not going to know that they're saved on this earth. We're not going to say, oh yeah, that guy's saved. But you know what? One day you may see that person in heaven and say, man, I didn't even know you were saved. <laughs> it's like, that's going to happen. It's a reality. That's the reality. So, <clears throat> the other thing is, uh, when, we, when we go soul winning, you know, obviously we're preaching eternal life to people. That's what we're doing. So that's why I'm relating it to this. But we always will open up and we'll ask people, you know, do you know you have eternal life? And they'll be like, nobody can know. Nobody can know that you have eternal life. And so we always say, well, you can know. You know, and that's my fourth point, is that you can know that you have eternal life. There is a way to know. So turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Now, we all, we all usually will quote or show somebody 1 John 5. <clears throat> I'm just going to read it, verse number 11. It says, And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. And verse 13 is the one we always show. It says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Now, I always thought it was interesting how it says that you may know that you have eternal life, but it's encompassed by, uh, you know, believe on the name of the Son of God. You know, it says it before, and then it says it after. And that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. So it's like, right in the middle, it's like pancaked in the middle there. <laughs> so that's pretty interesting that, uh, you know, God's just making it very clear there in 1 John 5. But I had you turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. <clears throat> the Bible says uh, <clears throat> elsewhere, you can know you have eternal life just because you've believed. But there's also some signs you can see of eternal life. As a believer, it says, first, Hebrews chapter 12 verse 5 says, And ye have gotten the exhortation which keepeth unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scour scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the, Lord, whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. So the Bible is real clear that all are partakers of chastisement. As a believer, you know, it's, it, it may not be some kind of public chastisement. It may not be something that everybody's going to see. Like, uh, you know, you're, you know, being rebuked or something at church or, you know, something that people can see. It may just be like you're, you're behind on your bills. Nobody knows that. You're behind on your bills and you can't seem to get ahead because because you're, you're not doing God's will, and therefore He's not blessing you. You know, He's not blessing you with that raise that you would have gotten, maybe, if you were in God's will. You never know. You know, God has a plan for us, and He's going to reward those that diligently seek Him. And But He's also going to chastise those because He's dealing with you as a son. You know, John chapter 1 says, But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God. So we know when we believe we become a son of God. We receive eternal life. We're a son of God. And therefore, he dealeth with us as with sons. You know, and when my children do something wrong, I don't want them to do it again. So guess what? I punish them. We give them a spanking. You know, that's what the Bible teaches. You know, withhold not correction from the child. You know, 
Spare not the rod. He who spareth the rod hateth his son. You know, but he that loveth him, chasteneth him be times. So, and, you know, you've got to love your children. God loves you. And so, if you are a son, whereof all are partakers of chastisement. Because God loves you. If you're his child, he's going to chastise you. You know, and then, also, it's also in Proverbs chapter 3. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 3 just says, verse 11, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. So it's very clear that God will deal with you as with the son. He will correct you. But, you know, you can know for sure that you have eternal life. That fourth point is, is very clear. 1 John 5.13 makes it plain as day that you can know for sure. And it's just by believing on, on, on the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see that. We see a change in people when we go out soul winning. When we go out soul winning and we ask them what they believe. They tell us what they believe. And then you show them the gospel. They, they see what you're saying. And then at the end you say, well, look, you know, this is what you did. You, you told me you believe. You know, this is what the Bible says. You know, do you believe this? And then they, they make a change. They make a choice. At that moment, they make a choice to either receive that word and call upon the name of the Lord, or they reject it. And when they receive it, though, at the end, most of the time, I'll always ask them, you know, as I'm leaving or something, I'll just say, you know, you know, well, at least now you know how to get to heaven, right? And I'll say, well, what do you got to do? And without fail, they'll always give me the right answer. Sometimes people, you know, you just run into some people that don't get it. You go through the gospel, you think they're getting it, they, they pray with you, but <clears throat> at the end it's just like, no, that's not it. And it's like, well, you just don't count that one. But the thing is, is most people, when you go through the gospel, you show them it, they pray with you. We don't pressure them into it. We just urge them to do it. I mean, it's, it's expedient for them to do that. We should, uh, you know, some say with fear, pulling them out of the fire. We need to pull people out of the fire. We should try to save them with fear. Not some extreme crazy story of fear, but, I mean, something relevant. You should at least urge them. You know, I, I, I talked to a lady, and I, I was talking to her, and I just related it to when, where she asked me. She didn't want to pray. She didn't want to call upon the name of the Lord. And so I, I just said, well, pretend I never came by your house. And, you know, I, I, I explained to her that this, this scenario would never happen in real life because this is not what happens when you die. But she said, I said, she said, okay, we'll go on. And I said, uh, <clears throat> you know, you die and you get to heaven's gate. And they ask you, what do you have to do to come in? And, and immediately the lady was like, I wouldn't get in. And I was like, see? Why? Because I gave you the wrong answer. And I said, exactly, you gave me the wrong answer. And I just showed you what the Bible says you have to do to be saved, but, you know, you didn't receive, you don't want to receive it, you know? And she said, well, I changed my mind. I want to, I want to pray. I want to receive it. You know, and so that's, that's what we have to do. We have to urge people to receive it. I didn't try to scare the lady. I mean, but I did a little bit. Okay, because that is scary. It's a scary thought. But it's reality. The re reality is, is she's not going to get that chance to stand before heaven's gate. The moment she dies on this earth and lifts up her eyes, she's going to be in hell. That's the reality. Now, I could have told her that, but then she would have probably just been like, get out of the house. You know, so, so I came up with a different scenario, you know, but it worked. I mean, the lady got saved, and when I left, she answered the questions right. And I was just like, amen. She said she was going to come to church. I hope she does. That would be awesome. But, uh, you know, the thing is, eternal life is, is something that you can have. You will never die, which is awesome. I don't want to die. I want to live forever. I want to live forever. And everybody wants to live forever. Everybody's seeking to be younger, to be more fit, you know, to, to all these celebrities. They never want to die. I ask them, you know. And then... So, never dying, that's pretty awesome. I mean, we'll live for a thousand years on this earth, and then we'll live for eternity. I mean, man, that's a long time, a thousand years. 
and then eternity? That's a long time. So, and then, you know, when, you're, <clears throat> when you receive eternal life, you're born again. You're born of the Spirit. And your, your spirit is quickened. You miss out on two deaths. And you, uh, you gain a birth. You gain an extra birthday. Oh, wow. <laughs> I mean, that's awesome. I like having two birthdays, you know. So my son's birthday is coming up. He, he loves his birthday. That's for sure. So, and then you can't lose eternal life. It's eternal. It's forever. You can't misplace it. You can't do anything to lose it. You can't uh, do something wrong and God say, nope, I'm taking it back from you. Because the thing is, God is the one keeping your eternal life. He has you in His hand. And then last of all, I showed you that <clears throat> you can know that you have eternal life. You can know just by what the Bible says. And then also, you can know because you'll endure chastening, whereof all are partakers. So, you know, once you're saved, you're always saved. People will mock that saying, but that's what the Bible teaches. Once you're saved, you're always saved. And, and it's a blessing to know that we can't screw up our salvation. Because we're imperfect people, and we screw up all the time. But you know what? That's one thing I can't screw up. Because... I know that I'm saved. I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. I called upon His name. He gave me eternal life. And at that point, there's nothing I can do to lose it. So that, that's an awesome thing. It's something that we need to be uh, <clears throat> rooted and grounded in. Know how we can explain it to people. It's very important. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, just thank you for this day. Just thank you for all the people that showed up tonight to the service. I pray that you'll bless them for being here. Give them a safe travels home. And I just thank you for eternal life. And that we, we will never die, Lord. And that you're keeping our salvation. It has nothing to do with us. You paid for it. You did all the hard work. All we have to do is believe. I thank you for that. And I just pray and ask all these things. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen.